uh, allow me to introduce uh, Woleo Labaji. Uh, Woleo Labaji um, is, uh, is our friend um, who serves the Lord in Nigeria, based in Abuja, and works uh, together at the convener, conveners of the Christian Teachers Summit, uh, which I have been privileged to be part of in 2019 and even this year as one of their guest speakers. And it's a great joy for him to come and join with us. He's also done um, a devotional that helps us to engage, um, that helps us to engage um, the, our professions from a Christian perspective. And therefore we are delighted to have him this morning um, to come and um, share with us. Welcome so much, Wole. Thank you very much, John. Wonderful. Are there any Nigerians that have come with you? Are there other Nigerians on the call? I, I think uh, this is here, but ah. I assumed uh, it was uh, a meeting. Hi, this Hi John. Wonderful. Hello, everybody. Great. Thank you very much, John. And uh, Maggie and uh, I now know Alex Mukui. And uh, thank you, John, for introducing us to our Eastern African family. Uh, like uh, Dr. Munene already said, uh, we're experiencing a global pandemic. Everyone is either affected or impacted in some way. Uh, countries all over the world are grappling with responding to this novel scenario that we're all confronted with. And in the middle of this sort of disruption, it is apt that the conference has decided to focus uh, all of our attentions as teachers uh, in this specific uh, segment of the education system on how we respond. First of all, as individuals, and ultimately as a fellowship to this sort of disruption, uh, what many people are calling the new normal. How do we as a people uh, respond in a way that not only honors our faith, but also helps us to be effective uh, in the dis discipline of the nations, which is our primary responsibility. So uh, over the next uh, 40 minutes or thereabout, I hope, I'm hoping that we can share a few things uh, that can serve as foundation for us for how we approach this new reality that we're all uh, forced to live with. Now, we've been locked down, uh, even though the lockdown is easing up for many countries, uh, it's easing up here in Nigeria. I imagine it's the same in most of East Africa. But we've been locked down for months, and even though things are easing up, we're still not fully back to how life used to be. And so uh, this sort of makes us go back to scripture to, to look at a tale of two lockdowns and how people then responded to those scenarios. So if you open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 32, uh, verse 1 to 4, I'd read from here very quickly. It says, now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, come make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool, and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, that's, that's a complete turnaround. Uh, in such a very short time for people who have seen the hand of God literally in very clear and massive terms. Uh, the plagues in Egypt, 
the crossing of the Red Sea. And they had now come to a place where just over the course of 40 days being locked down, waiting for Moses to go and hear from God and bring them word, uh, the nation had entirely become apostate in a period of 40 days. And they had sent to Aaron, look, as far as Moses is concerned, we no longer have confidence that he's going to come back to us. Uh, they were probably making the assumption that Moses was dead. And they had said to themselves, look, we need to move on with our lives, okay? And to be able to move on, uh, we no longer have Moses as leader. And because Moses was the one who had the connection with God and the relationship with God, and we do not, uh, we've got to find a new God to basically take us forward. And this is shocking we, when we read it in retrospect, but we have to situate ourselves in that sort of scenario and ask ourselves, many of us have been disconnected, as it were, from our spiritual leaders, our pastors and all of that. And we have done faith by ourselves over the lockdown period. The Israelites were doing faith by themselves because they had been detached from Moses, who was their spiritual leader at the time. And in their case, they had completely gone full circle and lost faith. And so we, we, we have to ask ourselves, what has been the impact of this pandemic on us as individuals? What has been the impact of the separation from fellowship and from spiritual leadership for those of us who have been impacted by it? So that's, that's one lockdown. Now, there is another lockdown that we'll read about in Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2. And in chapter 1, Jesus has said to his disciples, uh, go and wait for me in Jerusalem. Do not depart. And wait for the promise of the Father. And the disciples had gathered. Uh, regularly, the Bible says they'll gather and pray and Basically, I had stayed in one place and had not left Jerusalem until the promise of the Father came in Acts chapter 2 from verse 1. For the Bible says they were sitting uh, in that place uh, in the upper room and the Holy Spirit came like a mighty rushing wind and they were all baptized in the Holy Ghost. So we see two different lockdown scenarios. The Israelites in uh, the wilderness were locked down waiting for God's word to come down via Moses and the disciples were waiting in Jerusalem for the promise of the father. But we see two entirely different outcomes for these two lockdowns. And so it says to us very clearly that for many people, the outcomes from this lockdown might be different. Some people might be in different stages of entirely losing their faith while some other people might actually have their faith completely transform and grow and become more effective. Uh, the question that must agitate our minds, you know, as we have this conversation this morning is, what is going to be our story, you know, for our own lockdown? Now, crisis in itself is not a problem. You know, disruptions in themselves are not the problem. Uh, disruptions and crisis are actually a filter there is turning point for individuals and uh, groups and nations. Uh, if you look at Joseph, for instance, he had many crisis situations in his life, many disruptions, but they were always a turning point that promoted him. If you looked at Esther, the same thing. If you look at David, for instance, uh, David shows up uh, on the battlefront and Israel is growing through a crisis. Uh, Goliath is out there taunting the nation. And basically, Israel was staring defeat in the face on, unless something happened. They were probably hoping that God would intervene and do something. But then that crisis became a turning point. It became a filter that promoted David. So we see, if we look at the lives of all of these individuals, if you look at Gideon, it was a crisis. Uh, Israel was under siege. And everyone was basically hiding in lockdown to make a living. And Gideon received the word and acted on that word. And that became a turning point, not only for him as an individual, 
but also for the nation at that point in time. Saul, on the other hand, uh, the crisis that he faced in his life were also turning points, but they were turning points for the negative. And so every time we encounter crisis in scripture or in history, we find that the outcomes vary from one individual to another, from one group to another, from one nation to another. I mean, look at how nations are responding to the COVID crisis. Uh, you will find that nations in Scandinavia, for instance, or uh, in countries like Singapore have responded very well, while a country like America has not responded so well, not even the United Kingdom. So crises are not the problem in themselves. They're a filter and they're typically a turning point for a people or an individual. And that's what really uh, forms the trust of the conversation we're having this morning. What's going to be the response of the East African Christian teacher as an individual and as a fellowship to this crisis. Uh, already, uh, there's you know, some indication uh, your conference has moved online. Uh, that's a response, okay? That's a turning point in itself. And how we go forward uh, with this is a function of the foundations that were built under us. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, and 20, 25 and 26 and 27, there is a very um, important insights that we find in that portion of scripture. And I'll just read it. And Jesus was speaking here and says, and, and this was after uh, giving a series of sermons, the sermon that we call the Sermon on the Mount and all of those things that he taught. And then he came to this point where he gives a summary and a concluding statement. And he says, all who listen to my instructions and follow them. Uh, they're like a wise man who builds his house on a solid rock. And though the rains come in torment, torrents and the floods rise and the storms beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on a rock. And then he says, but those who hear my instructions and ignore them are like a foolish man who builds his house on sand. For when the rains come and the floods come and the storms and winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Now, two things are important for us to note in this portion of scripture. First of all, I think the houses are identical. So it's not a problem of the house. I also think that the conditions that the houses were subjected to are identical, you know, the, the storm, beat down on both of them. The floods rose against both of them. Uh, the wind and the rain, you know, impacted both of them. But the difference in the outcomes is vastly different. Okay? While one house stood firm in spite of all of the disruption and the crisis, the other house fell with a mighty crash. And the thing that differentiates and results in these two outcomes is the sort of thing that the houses were built upon. And so the question for me and for everyone who's listening in on the call this morning is, what sort of foundation is your house built upon? In this period that you've been locked down, you know, for some countries, two months, for some countries, longer, what sort of foundations have you taken the time to build? The thing is, it, it's not our responsibility to worry about storms. Storms are going to come. Uh, there's nothing we can do to uh, eliminate their arrival, okay? As we move progressively towards the end of the age, we're going to constantly see disruptions of this nature. So we, we have nothing within our powers to do to prevent storms from coming. Our responsibility is to build the sort of foundation that can see us through every storm that may come against us. So the question is, what kind of foundation are you building? Or have you built over the years 
as a response, as a mitigant to the storms that will inevitably come against us. Now, I'd like to start to head towards one other story in scripture, you know, to sort of look at how we've responded, you know, how we've been stewards of our time and our money during this lockdown. Now, for many countries, uh, in Nigeria, for instance, uh, the education sector has been significantly impacted. Now, I know for most of uh, Kenya, and I don't know if this is the same for all of East Africa, I know for most of Kenya, uh, the education system is largely public sector driven. In Nigeria, the education system is largely private sector driven. And so while in a place like Kenya, the government may have continued to pay uh, the salaries of teachers, in a place like Nigeria, because students have not resumed school, uh, private schools have not received fees, and consequently, they've not been able to pay teachers. So the consequence for people here has been uh, quite serious. And perhaps, you know, uh, to some extent, uh, as similarly happened in East Africa. So, but the question that we must ask ourselves, in addition to the ones we have asked this morning is, how well have we stewarded our time and the money that we have received even in these lean times? Because the truth of the matter is how we do this reflects two things. One, it reflects what our priorities are, and then it predicts what our posterity will be. What I'm saying is what you have done with your time in this lockdown is a reflection of your priorities. Okay, uh, and what you've done with the money that you've earned in this time is a reflection of your priorities. If we, if we flip back to the story that we started with, uh, the lockdown in uh, Exodus chapter 32, you know, the Bible says there and, uh, from verse five, it says, so when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Okay, so essentially Moses didn't show up or we're on our way to the promised land. We were expecting some message from God, but you know, there was a disruption. Moses failed to show up, uh, they invented a new God, and let's eat and be merry, basically, okay? So you find out that their priorities, the, 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 the choices they made about how they were going to spend their time going forward was to just eat and be merry. So for us, it's important to ask ourselves this question in the season that we've been locked down. Uh, what value have we created? What new foundations have we built under our lives? In Matthew chapter 25, there's a story, a very important story of a servant whose master had given him uh, some talents to trade with. There were three of them, as you know, and two of them, you know, upon reckoning with their master when he returned, had done very well uh, with the resources and the opportunity that they had. But the third one had done absolutely nothing with the resources that he was given by his master. And, and two questions or two possibilities, you know, arise in my mind about what he may have done with his time. We know what he did with the resources that he was given. He basically buried it and did absolutely nothing with it. But I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about what he then did with his time while those resources stayed buried underground. So there are two possibilities that I've you know, imagined were possible. One is that he did absolutely nothing in that time. The second one is that he did his own business, okay? He either did nothing, you know, just sat around, eat food and be merry and play and get entertained and all of that. Or he focused on doing his own business. Now, as you know, these two things are not tenable things to do as a servant. A servant, because he's owned, 
and owes his master his entire life cannot sit and do nothing. On the second hand, a servant, because owes his entire life to his master, does not have the right to do his own business. So whatever this guy was doing while his master was away, the Bible says the master was away for a very long time. Whatever he was doing in this time did not reflect that he understood that he had a master. And so again, for us, what we've done during this lockdown, if we have done nothing, it reflects that we don't understand that we have a master. And if we have pursued only our own business, it also reflects that we don't understand that we have a master. Because we were indeed purchased with a price and we owe our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when uh, he seemingly is away from us and we have time, we have to account for what we've done with that time and the opportunities and the resources that he has brought our way during that time. So the, the lockdown in reality ought to have been a time to build. This is what I'm actually heading to. That in this period where we've been, you know, uh, at home in the most and haven't had, you know, a full schedule of work to do, we should have taken the opportunity to build foundations, not only under our own lives, but under the lives of the people that God has given us uh, authority to steward their lives for him. Now, uh, our experience here in terms of how schooling has gone for the children is they've done uh, most of their schooling online during this period. And uh, one of my daughters, I mean, one of my children, my daughter, who is uh, 12 uh, and in high school, one particular teacher has stood out for us during this season. You know, he has repeatedly uh, looked out to make sure that the children were getting uh, the right amount of instruction over this period. He had been concerned about their welfare uh, because schooling had happened online when certain students had failed to show up in class. He had gone the extra mile, you know, to reach out to parents to find out if everything was okay and all of that. So this clearly was someone who wasn't doing business as usual. This clearly was someone who uh, thought there was additional responsibility that he had over the lives of the words that God had put under him. And so for us, you know, the lockdown has offered us a perfect opportunity to uh, basically stomp proof our lives, to build foundations for ourselves and to build foundations under the lives of other people. And, and that's what I thought that individual was trying to do, to go the extra mile, to build foundations for other people. Now, I, I don't know if you've done schooling online, but what extra mile have you gone, okay, as an instructor? Also, this period of lockdown would, if we're honest with ourselves, have showed us that maybe a problem in the past has not been that we didn't have enough time for the things of God, because here now we have all the time. So if we haven't done the assignments that God required of us, Maybe the problem is not that we had inadequate time, but we have inappropriate priorities. Because we've had weeks after week, you know, of sitting down and doing very little. If we have not been able to get onto those projects that we've had all this while that we were going to get onto, maybe we've had problem with prioritizing and not a problem with time. And so as we look it out to build stormproof lives. We go back to that Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. And it says two things that we're going to then dwell on as we sort of wrap up uh, the session. And it says, all who listen to my instructions and follow them are wise. All who listen to my instructions and follow them are wise. It says they're like a man who builds his house on solid rock. And although the rains come in torrents, now this is talking about a certain scale of disruption. 
You know, it's not a mild rain. It's not a drizzle. It says even if the rain comes in torrents and the floods rise and the storms and the storm winds beat against its house, it won't collapse because it is built on rock. So what, what are the conditions for a house to uh, basically survive every storm? Two conditions. The first one is that the person listens to my instructions. And the second condition is that the person follows those instructions, okay? That he listens to my instructions and that he follows those instructions. On, on face value, these things might seem very, you know, easy to achieve, but they're not as easy to achieve, okay? Let's look at listening in an age of mass distraction. Uh, if you look at the image on the screen, uh, we see Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and Instagram and I think Tinder. And someone has aptly described them as weapons of mass distraction. Weapons of mass distraction. That in a time where the such, you know, uh, gamuts of offerings out there that can take our time and get us completely uh, engaged, there's a tendency to not have the time to listen. And listening is not hearing. They're two different things entirely. Uh, uh, like I said, I can, I can hear Swahili. It doesn't mean that I understand what's being said. I can hear the sound uh, because I have the auditory mechanism to do that. I, I have my ears and I have all the membranes inside the ear and they're working properly. So I can hear anything that's said I can hear sound, okay? But hearing is one thing, understanding is another thing entirely. And so when, when, when it says anyone who listens, is talking about not just hearing, but understanding. Listening is a disposition, okay? Uh, if you read in Proverbs chapter 22, uh, verse 17, it talks about inclining our ears to his word. To incline means to, to be disposed to, okay? Uh, to bow our ears, to bow our hearts, you know, to hear what he has to say. This is a disposition, okay? When we listen, we, we, we take a certain disposition. First of all, uh, it means that we assume that we don't know, okay? We assume, first of all, that we don't know. Uh, we humble our hearts, okay, and uh, take, you know, the position that what God has to say to us is better than anything else that we have to do at that point in time. And listening also implies that we apply our hearts to what we're hearing, okay? Uh, you know, uh, in these times, there's such a big deal made about being able to multitask, okay? But every time we see God trying to talk to someone, the first thing that God tries to do is to gain their full attention. Uh, when God was going to speak with Moses in the wilderness, uh, he set a bush on fire and did not consume the bush. And the Bible says that when God saw that Moses turned Okay, when Moses paid attention to what was going on, God then spoke to him. Okay, uh, when God was going to speak with uh, Saul, who later became Paul on the way to Damascus, uh, we see that God needed to get his attention. Okay, so to apply our hearts means that we're not multitasking that, you know, the time that we spend in the word is not uh, something that we have on our to-do list that we just want to check off that we're actually fully engaged and fully engrossed. That's the only way to listen. To listen is an active disposition of our person towards hearing what God has to say. Now, the other thing that is important to emphasize about listening is Jesus says, my sheep, they know my voice. They know my voice and they hear me. 
when I speak. Uh, knowledge there talks about intimacy, okay? Uh, that if my wife was speaking, for instance, behind me, uh, I do not need to turn around to know that that's her speaking because there's a certain intimacy, there's a certain familiarity that I have with her voice. And I can tell that, oh, oh that's my wife speaking. And so listening is intimacy, it's familiarity with the voice of God. Now, familiarity can't happen except we invest time, okay? Uh, if we only meet with God once in a long while, there'll be no familiarity whatsoever. Every time we hear his voice, it will be a strange voice. Uh, the first time that Samuel heard the voice of God, he had no idea who was speaking. He thought it was Eli, okay? He ran and went to meet Eli and said, here I am, I heard you call me. There was no familiarity yet with the voice of God. There was no intimacy yet at that point with the voice of God. So listening, you know, sort of is beyond being able to hear, okay? Uh, it's not just hearing the message. It is being uh, disposed from our hearts to doing what the message says. Uh, because there's no point actually uh, hearing something when we're not disposed to doing what uh, we're being asked to do in that situation. And then... He says, after listening, we must be willing to follow what he says. We must be willing to obey what he has instructed. These are the two conditions for building stormproof lives. And what does it mean to follow? I'd like to go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, to look at how uh, the amplified version describes the idea of following. So it says, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to be my disciple, in other words, if anyone desires to follow me, it says, let him deny himself. And then the Amplified Version sort of breaks down what it means to deny oneself. It says to disregard, to lose sight of, and forget himself and his own interests. And to take up his cross and follow me, to cleave steadfastly to and to conform wholly to my example in living and if need be in dying also. So let's, let's just dwell, you know, briefly on each one of those, you know, expansions that the Amplified Version has given to the idea of self-denial and following. So it says to deny oneself is to disregard oneself, okay, to, to consider oneself of no importance in the way that the world thinks about being important, okay? Uh, the Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who regard their own wretch, I mean, who, who, who understand their own wretchedness, who understand their own need for salvation, who understand uh, their own helplessness. So, the first thing, you know, in following him is we have to disregard ourselves. Actually, if we have a high regard for ourselves and our own opinions, it's impossible to follow anyone. Anyone who has a high regard for his own self and his own opinion cannot actually follow anyone. Because to follow someone means to, to yield to their leading, to consider their opinions better than yourself, to consider their leadership you know, and their agenda to be better than one's own agenda. So the first thing is to disregard ourselves. Uh, the next one is even harder, is to lose sight of ourselves, okay? So that means the concept of self-preservation is completely lost, okay? To lose sight of ourselves. That if we're going to follow him, sometimes he's going to lead us into what we would consider dangerous territories. Territories that would require, you know, certain losses, as it were. And if we, if we keep sight of ourselves, if we keep sight of our own welfare, if we keep sight of our own priorities, we're going to balk when he asks us to follow him into those territories. Uh, if he asks us to uh, do things that threaten for instance, our livelihoods, 
you know, we're going to balk. We're going to say, well, I, I'm willing to only go as far, but not that far. Uh, a young man came to Jesus one time and said, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Are you saying I am God in essence? And, and then they go on and have a conversation about what he must do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus says to him, you must do this, you must do that one, you must do the other one. And, you know, very proudly, the young man says, oh, I've done all of those things uh, since I was, you know, a young man. I've lived a good life, basically, all this time. And Jesus says to him, well, uh, it looks like there's just one thing left for you to do. Uh, go and sell everything you have, uh, give it to the poor, and come back and follow me. And the Bible says that the man went away very sorrowful. You know, he was willing to follow Jesus up to a point. Up to the point where, you know, it wouldn't require him to give up everything that he owned. So he was, he was looking for a convenient journey of discipleship. Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you're going to follow me on my own terms. You're going to lose sight of your own agenda and your own priorities. So losing sight of ourselves is another condition for following him. And I have to admit to you, brothers and sisters, that this is not exactly a very easy thing to do. Uh, if we're really going to be able to build a storm-proof life, uh, we're going to pay a significant price. And then the third thing, you know, that uh, that idea of self-denial is expanded into is that he forgets himself. He forgets himself. Now, this is, you know, even a bit more difficult. You know, you can for a time lose sight of yourself. In a sense, you're, you're, you're making a sacrifice. That young man could have sold everything because he was sacrificing. But to really forget ourselves, you know, to, to not only not look to our own agendas and priorities, but to actually forget that we exist, that's, that's tough, okay? But this is a condition for following him. This is a condition for following him. And then let's skip to uh, number five, because I think forgetting our own interests uh, syncs, you know, directly with forgetting ourselves. Number five then says to cleave steadfastly to me to cleave steadfastly to me. It means to hold on irrespective. So this is, uh, think again of that young man who maybe agrees to sell everything and to follow Jesus. And then in following him, it gets to another juncture in the journey and some other level of difficulty is introduced. Uh, so for instance, for the disciples, they came to one point and Jesus was teaching what many consider to be a difficult subject, you know, something that uh, there were two occasions when, you know, he taught things that his disciples thought to be difficult. The first one was about marriage, you know, and when he had finished teaching about uh, the fact that divorce was not something God intended for believers, uh, the disciples said to him, if the issue of marriage is so difficult, maybe one shouldn't get married at all, okay? They thought it was a very difficult thing. And the second time, when he had taught this very hard thing, the disciples said to him, ah, this is a very hard thing, you know, and, and the Bible says many stopped following him from that point in time. And then Jesus turned to his faithful followers and said to them, what about you guys? Are you also going back? Because I see some people have left, okay? Are you leaving too? I need to know where you stand uh, with regard to what I've just taught. Are you going to stick with me irrespective of this hard teaching? Or are you about to leave? So cleaving steadfastly to him, it's not that we join as disciples. It's that in the course of the journey, when there are hard teachings and hard instructions, do we continue with him on the journey? Or we say, well, this is too hard. No one can take this. Uh, I'm going to say, well, it was nice while I knew you, but I'm going to continue this journey by myself. Many people make this decision when difficulties come in their marriage. You know, they say to him, well, these things that you're teaching about marriage, uh, I, I, I'm not sure I can live with it, okay? Or when difficulties come with disruptions like we're experiencing, and it's impacting maybe income, you know, and there are opportunities to make income in a way that does not 
honor the Lord. Many people will say, well, I've got to eat. I've got to feed my family. Uh, this teaching about being a faithful steward and being a person of integrity, uh, it's not going to put food on the table. So I've got to do what a man has to do. So when it says to cleave steadfastly, it means to join me and never leave me. Okay. And then in all of this, the final point of our entire journey with the Lord, uh, the final point of disregarding ourselves and losing sight of ourselves and forgetting ourselves and cleaving steadfastly to him, the final point of this is so that we can conform wholly to his example. Okay. And you know, this is the destiny that God has planned out for everyone who comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, from a verse, uh, about verse 29, that, you know, uh, them that he called, he also justified, them that he justified, he glorified, that we might be conformed to the image of his son. So God's entire agenda for his children is that we become like Jesus so that he can be the firstborn among many brethren. You find the same thing in Ephesians chapter 4, that the entire point of every work of ministry is so that the saints can come to full maturity. They can come to fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. So all of our discipleship journey is so that we can conform completely to his example, so that we can be molded as it were. You know, in the beginning, God made man in his image, and then man fell, and God came as man so that man can become like God in Christ, okay? So that's the entire purpose of this entire journey, okay? That we become holy uh, like our Savior. And this is, you know, how we build this foundation under ourselves so that when storms like COVID and every other storm that we're going to inevitably experience comes against us. Our foundations are so well built because we've learned to listen and we've learned increasingly to follow and we're being shaped continually into the image of Christ. I'd like to say, you know, word of prayer in closing uh, and then perhaps take a few questions uh, afterward. Let's just bow our heads uh, as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that you have sent us this morning to challenge our hearts. And these words that have come to ask us to reckon with you, how we've used that time, how we've used the resources and the opportunities that you have brought our way, how, O oh Lord God, we have accounted for this period of lockdown. These words have come to reckon with us about the sort of foundations that have been built on our lives. These words have come to query us about our walk with you, our agendas and our priorities and how steadfastly we have clung to you and what we are becoming in our discipleship journey. And Lord, we, we ask that as we have looked in the mirror of your word, we will not go away forgetting what we look like, but that that which we have heard, we will receive grace to be able to do in the mighty name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we pray, O oh Lord God, for the conference, and this early tracks that are building up to the conference. And Lord, we are asking that uh, the storms that confront us as individual members of this fellowship, Lord, that the outcomes for us will be that our building and the institutions that we represent will continue to stand after the storms have passed. And we pray, uh, even as the weekly meetings continue, Lord, that your word will continue to uh, be available to us. There'll be no death of your word. 
and that the ability to listen and recognize your voice, Lord, and to discern your speech will be made available to us in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Hello, John. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, my brother Wale. That was so much on point. Uh, we so thank God for you and coming to raise in our hearts. I think for me, I'm stuck on the fact that you say that crises and disruptions are a filter to reveal yeah. our real foundations. Yeah. That how I spend my time now is starting to reveal what I truly live for and what are my priorities. I think that has pierced my heart uh, because I am... I am, I am so tempted just to do nothing, just to do nothing, revealing that I am not even aware or understand about my master. So I want to welcome this um, uh, time to us. Um, I hope everyone can uh, stretch a bit. Uh, we can maybe give about 15, uh, 10, 15 minutes to reflect on this. Uh, and because we are many, Apparently, the chat room is full. There are many more who are watching us on Facebook. Um, sorry for those who are not able to get to us. Uh, I think we will need to uh, change this next weekend. But because we are many and because of the challenges of sound, uh, we want to welcome you and invite you to actually text your questions. Wole will be with us. Please kindly text your questions and then Wole will be able to see them and uh, respond to us. So you're welcome to either make a, your comment. A number of us have been making a comment uh, all along as we have been moving, um, as the session has been going on. Um, and I think it would be wonderful just to get a number of those questions coming from different places. Um, generally is saying that where else can we go? We need to cleave to Jesus. And I think this is a, such a wake up call for all of us. So Karibuni to send your texts so that we can respond. And as your texts come in, um, I'm so thankful for the movement um, of Christian teachers in Nigeria. Um, and Wole wanted to make a clarity that indeed he is a core convener. Uh, they, uh, they do this as a team, just like we do as a team here in East Africa, uh, okay. because such work is not possible to be done by one individual. And okay. he is a core convener. And one of the things that I greatly benefited from and learned from him because in the last uh, conference they had in January, I stayed in his home for the week. And uh, Wale is an architect, uh, holds a master's in, in architecture and a master's in strategic management and now pursuing another master's in organizational leadership and runs his own real estate company there in Abuja. And I was so blessed that he actually takes off every Thursday in the week just to spend time with God as a businessman. And I thought that's quite challenging uh, because many of us do not, do not have the habit. I personally, I wasn't as strict to my Sabbath. Many times I would compromise my Sabbath. And you know, he, watching him, the time that I stayed with him, listening to him, uh, seeing him wake up in the morning at five uh, to pray and have devotion with his wife and children consistently every day, even when they had they were hosting me and my wife, that was quite a challenge to me. And therefore I would attest that indeed, um, the things he is speaking about this morning, he leaves them. And, and I was so blessed also to be, um, to be the, the, it's called what? The de-educated Dylan, de uh, from the mentality we have about Nollywood and Nigerians and uh, I wanted to let Wole know that we have this stereotype about what kind of Nigerians we have. And I met a different kind of Nigerian. 
quiet and uh, speaks and teaches uh, in a way that we differently see on the television. And thank you so much, our brother Wale. Uh, is there a question you can see there that you can respond to? Um, I haven't seen any question. Uh, I've seen people uh, noting their takeaway. Someone did ask, how do we help our students to stand? Okay, maybe you can go and answer that one. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure how uh, students are engaging with their tutors at this point in time, but the first uh, thing that I would say is that you need to spend time in prayer uh, for your students. Um, I think when we have people under our tutelage, we have a sort of authority and spiritual oversight over their lives. And the first place to discharge that responsibility is in the place of prayer. Uh, what I'm also learning to do uh, with people that God has brought uh, around me for this season is to find time to also uh, do personal engagements with them. I find that when we're uh, engaged in the context of maybe our worship centers and churches and all of that, that yes, you know, great messages may go out, but that you do not really know how well people are doing in receiving those messages and living their lives by them until you engage personally. So if you have the opportunity uh, and I know that because you're teachers and students, you may not have, but if you do have the opportunity to engage one-on-one -on -one with some of the students, that is a very helpful way to sort of uh, gauge where they are spiritually and to be able to intervene by correcting uh, ideas and by, by teaching. So, but at the minimum, every one of us must be able to pray for whoever God has brought uh, within our sphere of influence. The other thing that you can do is to share resources with them. So books that have been a help for you, uh, media that have been a help for you, uh, things that you can uh, offer to these people. What I've also uh, consistently done is people who uh, are around me, uh, if I'm in, uh, say, a WhatsApp group, where I think they're going to benefit from, I tend to invite them to join so that they're also uh, learning from the things that I'm learning from. Okay, so I think there are a number of options uh, for how we can help them. But I, my view is that praying uh, over their lives is the minimum that we can do and should do. Oh, great. And... In terms of, um, I think in terms of the, 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 the issue you've raised about that doing nothing, I think for some time, many of us were not doing anything. Maybe you can repeat that for those maybe who logged in a little bit later. The temptation mm -hmm. during this pandemic actually has been to do nothing. Mm -hmm. And we've also been uh, kind of surrounded by all these weapons of mass destruction. Would you repeat that again, just for emphasis? Okay, yeah. So uh, that came off of the story of the, the third servant who had been given one talent and who, when his master came back, the Bible says after a long time, you know, I, I think that emphasis is important. After a long time, the master came back and said, so what were you able to accomplish? And he says, well, uh, nothing. I, I just kept your money for you because I know you're a difficult person to deal with. Uh, here is the money that you gave me. You can take it back. Uh, many of us have been locked down for months and we're just starting to ease up now. Where Jesus to come, you know, to reckon and to sort of settle accounts with us and to say, in the period of the lockdown, what did you do on my behalf? What did you do for me? Uh, what did you accomplish? you know, in my name. Uh, what's going to be our response? Are we going to say nothing? Or like the other two, we're going to say, uh, these are the opportunities that I had during this period. 
And this is the outcome of how I exerted myself with those opportunities. These are the resources that you gave me during the lockdown. And now this is what I've been able to turn them into. So if you've been a teacher and you've thought, oh, this is a very extended leave. Let me just relax and enjoy myself. Uh, I, I can think of two people who had that attitude in scripture. One, the nation of Israel in the wilderness. The Bible says, and the people ate and drank and rose up to play. So that's one group of people that had that attitude. The other person that had that attitude is a rich man whose ground yielded a great harvest. And he said to himself, you know what? My soul, relax. You know, just take a break, you know, and enjoy yourself. So we haven't been given this time so we can just relax and enjoy ourselves. Actually, God wants us to relax. You know, God is very emphatic about resting. You know, he's planned jubilees. He, God even demands that the land takes a rest. You know, uh, there's a one-year jubilee. There's a weekly day of rest and all of that. So God wants us to rest. But God rested one out of seven days, okay? He didn't rest for three months doing nothing. God walks. Uh, Jesus Christ said, He thought, oh, my father walketh, and I walk. The family that we come from, uh, the heavenly heritage that we have is a heritage of work. The first thing that God gave to mankind is work, okay? And that work uh, we need to continually do while, you know, balancing out with resting. Bible says it's in uh, returning and resting that we regain our strength, okay? But we can't rest indefinitely. We can't do nothing. That's not something that is a reflection of a discipleship with Jesus because Jesus Christ, uh, there was never a time when he did nothing. Actually, his priority above and beyond food was to do my father's work and to finish it. He said, my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So it's important for us to understand that there is a work and to constantly you know, return to that work and to make sure that it is being done. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We appreciate uh, taking time to be with us this morning. Uh, Brother Wole, we are glad. And I can see different of us, I think, are, are reflecting deeply. Uh, Rachel Nashipai is saying intimacy with God is familiarity with his voice. What we do with our time and money reflects whether we know our master. Uh, Dr. Njeri Gashohi, uh, powerful my take home, if I'm doing nothing or doing my own business, then I don't have a master. And there are many more messages um, here I'm reading and I'm glad uh, for the reflections and the things that God is speaking to us. At this time, I want to invite uh, one of the teachers, uh, Mrs. Ndamburi, just to lead us in prayer in, re in, in response to that message. Precious and loving Father, we humbly bow before you to thank you for giving us an opportunity to listen to such great words of wisdom, great words of inspiration, that have cost us King of Glory to come to a moment of soul searching and asking ourselves many questions. We thank you for your servant whom you've sent to us in this particular platform to talk to us. And King of Glory, as we have heard your word, our hearts are pierced. And our prayer this morning, Lord, is that you'll help each one of us to be good stewards, good stewards of the time, and the resources that you have given us. Amen. Help us, Jehovah Lord, to recognize that the time and the resources you've given us are not for our own benefit, but much more, oh God, that we may use them for your kingdom. Forgive us for the times that we have sat down and done nothing. And forgive us, Lord, also for the times that we have used these resources to just benefit your, ourselves and disregard your purpose. Help us even at this particular time, Lord, to think about your purpose, to think about your heartbeat and move in the direction that you are leading us. 
without fear, but with courage, knowing that you are the one who is leading us. We surrender and submit ourselves unto you, O God, and pray that God will help each one of us during this particular time of lockdown to be able to stop proof our lives mm. by listening to you and listening to your instructions and not just end at the point of listening, but after listening that we may be careful also to follow through to what you're calling us to do. Deliver us, Lord, from the time wasters, the weapons of mass destruction that have taken our time. And we pray that God, our hearts will be locked to your heart, mm-hmm. even as this time as we commit ourselves to lose ourselves disregard ourselves lose sight of ourselves and forget all that has got to do with ourselves Mm. and instead cleave to you oh god and focus on you so that we may be conformed day by day to the likeness and the image of your dear son jesus christ we therefore yield to you oh god as the teachers of this nation and the teachers of the East African nations, oh God. We are grateful that you could speak to us at such a time as this, in this manner. We therefore surrender to you and ask that God you will take preeminence. Lead us, King of glory. Let this time of lockdown be a time of transformation. As you have told us, King of kings, through your servant, that it's a time to build. Cause us to build our inner strength, King of glory, and cause us to build for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the times that are coming, that Jehovah Lord will be able to stand strong and glorify you in all our undertakings. We pray that God will help us to learn lessons from the the, the scriptures that we have read from the Israelites, and that God, you remain to be our God even during this particular time. We worship you. And we give you praise, even as we yield and surrender to you. And pray that in your own way, Lord, you speak to each one of us, even as we continue to meditate upon this word. In our private times of prayer and private times of the word, may you continue to echo your purpose in our hearts and in our lives, O God. We worship you and we give you praise. Thank you because you love us. And thank you because you have a good plan for us. Help us, King of Kings, that we will walk in it to the glory and honor of your name. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For such a time as this, such a time. who knows you're seated in the kingdom, in the kingdom to influence circumstances, to deliver God's people, such a time as this, for such a time as this, such a time.